Good evening and welcome to this evening's presentation of A Trunk Full of Stories with Mary Lincoln. I'm Jamie Stout, the Director of Membership for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. As many of you know, the ALPLM is once again open with very strict safety protocols for everyone's benefit. We have been so excited to see many of you back and when it's safe, we hope to see all of you back to Mr. Lincoln's museum. Over the past several months, we have been able to bring you virtual programming while we were closed, but you all said you loved it, and we did too, of course, so we wanted to continue this at least throughout 2020. Or throughout 2020. Um, tonight's presentation is brought to you uh, by a generous sponsor from Union Pacific, and tonight we have the honor to be in the presence of Pam Brown as Mary Lincoln. She will present to us a monologue about some treasures she's been packing around in one of her trunks. After her presentation, we will take questions from the audience, so please feel free to type those in the Q&A section below. A little bit about Pam. Pam has spent the last 30 years in Springfield, Illinois, directing and acting in theater in various theater productions. And in her free time, she enjoys nine grandchildren, and often you will see her around vol volunteering many ways in the community, but especially at the ALPLM. So please help me welcome Mrs. Lincoln. Well, thank you very much for having me this evening. It's a joy to be asked to come and visit with all of you tonight. Um, I thought it might be nice if you joined me in, in sorting through this trunk of mine. Uh, I brought many of them with me out of the White House. I'm sure many of you've heard. I spend a great deal of time these days just sorting through all of my trunks. Each one is like, it's like opening a birthday present. It's just full of memories. Mr. Lincoln, of course, he would have said, uh, full of flubdubs. <laughs> flubdubs. <sighs> I never got the opportunity to apologize to Mr. Lincoln for all my flub dubs while we were in the White House, and for that I am really very sorry. <sighs> well, let's get started, shall we? <laughs> oh, my goodness, what is this? I thought I got rid of all of my clothes. <laughs> I don't see the bodice. I hope it's packed in another trunk, otherwise somebody bought a bodice without a skirt. <laughs> oh, let's see. Look at this. Oh, this is my Taddy. Oh, this reminds me of those boys while we were in the White House. Tad and Willie, along with the Tap children. Well, they would put this poor little doll on trial for some military crime or another, and then they would sentence him to die by either firing squad or hanging. And then they would, well, they would carry him ever so gently and they would play a death dirge on their makeshift instruments and they would carry him out to the White House Rose Garden and they would bury him in the White House Rose Garden. And then Mr. Lincoln, of course, he would have to go back out into that garden every day and dig up poor dear Jack. How many times did he what, unbury him? Probably at least a dozen, maybe even more. <laughs> but one day the gardener, he was so exasperated with those boys and their continual burials, he walked over to the children and he said, boys, have you ever considered just asking the president to give this poor soldier a pardon? Well, of course, Taddy got very excited about the potential of that and he dashed right up those back stairs and sat down at the desk and asked the president to give Jack a pardon. <laughs> of course, Mr. Lincoln, being the doting father he was, he obliged them. <laughs> oh, the antics those boys pulled when we were in the White House. Oh, as irritating as I'm sure they were to the people working inside. I think they were preferred over the misery that was going on outside of the walls. <laughs> oh, I remember so clearly that first day when we walked into the White House. The boys went one direction, Mr. Lincoln and I went the other, and for about a half an hour, we saw hide nor hair of those boys. And the next thing we knew, we hear this little boy screaming, Paw, Paw! 
And these two boys come tearing down that grand staircase. And they said, Paul, we figured out a way to get up on top of the roof of the White House. And we think we should build a fort up there so we can watch for the enemy, which they ended up doing. Tom Pendle, he was the carpenter, the fixer in the White House. He helped the boys. Tad always called him Tom Penn. <laughs> well, then, of course, there was the times when Willie might write a theater piece and then they would invite visitors to come into the rooms, you know, the visitors that were waiting in line to go and see Mr. Mr. Lincoln. And they would come into the rooms and, and watch their shows. <laughs> and then, of course, there was that wonderful day when they discovered all the bell cords up in the attic. And they figured out a way to ring all of them simultaneously, causing the staff to rush madly from the mansion. And then, of course, there was that goat that was always running through the White House kitchen. <laughs> oh, oh, the White House. Oh, let's compare that to our very first home, <laughs> the Globe Tavern, right here in Springfield. Uh, now, our, our home was actually just one 12-foot by 14-foot room. And I know that because I measured it every day, detecting no signs of growth. <laughs> Well, we walked in as newlyweds. We were full of dreams and promises. We carried with us our clothes and a, and a few wedding gifts we had received. Probably not even enough to fill this one trunk. <laughs> oh, I always have to laugh at their advertisement. It always said eight pleasant and comfortable rooms for boarders, as well as convenient resting places for the weary. Now, mind you, a person would have had to have been very weary to forget any rest in that first home of ours. Well, we might have travelers pulling up in the dead of night, looking for a place to stay, and they would stand on the front step and they would pull on the clapper bell until someone finally answered the door. And then next door, we had the clanging and banging of the blacksmith, and our parlor was filled day and night with lobbyists and all of their shoutings. But then after Robert was born, they complained that his crying was too much noise. Oh, the nerve of them. Well, we gave them the slip. We ended up leaving the Globe, moved into a little cottage on 4th Street till we could finally afford that house at the corner of 8th Street and Jackson. We paid $1,500 for that house and the land. That's a very large expenditure, but one that was going to be greatly needed. Three children were born in that house. One died. Oh, let's get back to the boys, shall we? These boys, their antics, as I said, they were just so delightful on some occasions, but it also reminds me so many times of the antics I pulled when I was a little girl. Oh, take for instance, the time that my cousin, Betsy Humphreys and I, we decided that we wanted to be more grown up. And we thought the easiest way to appear grown up was to wear a hoop skirt under our dresses. Now do understand that girls our age were forbidden for wearing hoop skirts, but we decided we didn't care. So we fashioned our hoop skirts out of our petticoats by sewing a weeping willow limb on the inside of the hem of our petticoats. Well, come Sunday morning, we slipped those petticoats up underneath our Sunday dresses and we started walking down that grand staircase just so eloquently. <laughs> Before we got to the bottom, my stepmother stopped us and she told us to march ourselves back up those stairs and to remove those petticoats. I was so angry, not so much about the petticoat, but because my father did not defend me. Oh, well, let's, let's see what else we have in this trunk. Oh, oh, this is my precious box. I brought this from Lexington when I was traveling to Springfield the first time I moved there. I thought it would be a, a nice size to keep little trinkets in. I know there's some fun things in here. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, look at this, this. Okay, now this, this is a reminder of my second courtship with Mr. Lincoln. 
Now, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of the stories of our meeting, the long and awkward ruffian from Kentucky and the demure socialite of Springfield and how shyly he approached me at a Springfield cotillion. And he said, Miss Todd, I would like to dance with you in the worst way. <laughs> Rest assured he did dance with me in the worst way. <laughs> But, of course, that ended up being a joke between Mr. Lincoln for the rest of our lives. But this led to a lot of other things. Now, our first courtship, now, let's say it was, hmm, it was just cut short. In fact, um, I think my exact words were, go, and then I stamped my foot, and I said, and you never come back. It was cut very short. A misunderstanding, a mistake. An intention misunderstood. Far too many misses prevented me from quickly becoming Mr. Lincoln's missus. And then the army came into play. The veritable legion, the army of our friends that worked so valiantly to bring us back together. Uh, now, of course, my sister Elizabeth, she thought our match to be a mismatch from the beginning, but not all of Springfield were nearly as short-sighted. Eliza Francis and her husband Simeon they secretly brought us together in their parlor. And Dr. Henry, he did the, did the same thing. Now, Mr. Lincoln, he always called that breakup the fatal first. Why, he even missed six consecutive days of the January's legislative session in his grief. One of his close friends wrote, Lincoln is rather in a bad way. The doctors say he came within an inch of being a perfect lunatic for life that I do believe, but I do know that his friend Joshua Speed took away his razor as a precaution. Why, he even wrote to my cousin John Stewart that he was the most miserable man living, and if what he felt were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on the planet. I suffered as well, but I had to suffer in my silence. But this... <laughs> One fall afternoon, a smiling and I would say lovingly handsome Abraham Lincoln, well, he strolled down the Springfield Street to my sister's home and, and handed me something that was, well, as close as he could come to a sentimental peace offering. Election returns from his last three legislative races. <laughs> he certainly knew the way to my heart. Oh, now you ladies, you can cherish your lovers, gardenias, and rose blossoms as you wish. I have my election returns. <laughs> and these led to, to these. We sealed our reconciliation in the ink of the Sangamo Journal. All right, he wrote, where is it? No. Too well, this is it, too well I know how much you suffer, but do, do remember, it is not my fault that I am so handsome and so interesting. <laughs> to which I replied, in newsprint, mind you, let him come here and he may squeeze my hand as hard as I squeeze the butter. And if that ain't personal satisfaction, I can only say he was the first man not satisfied with squeezing my hand. <laughs> to which Mr. Lincoln responded, Oh, hmm. I know he's a fighting man. He would rather fight than eat. But isn't marrying better than fighting? Although it tends to run into it. <laughs> a courtship made public in a Springfield newspaper. No, actually, these were just a joke between Mr. Lincoln and me. You see, he had written this anonymous letter to the newspaper. It was from the fictional Lost Township under the name Rebecca. Well, it was simply just a ruse to embarrass all the local Democrats. So my friend Julia Jane and I, after reading that letter, we knew exactly who had written that letter. So we didn't want to be left out of the fun. So we wrote an anonymous letter of our own in reply. And we also pinned some satirical poetry to go right along with it. Well, the next thing we knew, the entire town was eagerly awaiting the next installment of those Rebecca letters. A few folks realized that once Mr. Lincoln and I strayed away from the politics, we were getting into the serious politics of courtship. <laughs> but the letters, 
Well, they quickly turned into more than just a playful prank in the newspaper. When one James Shields, now he was the Illinois Democratic auditor that Julia and I tended to lampoon in our poem. Well, it seems he got his back up and he went to Simeon and demanded to know who wrote that poem. Well, unbeknownst to me and Jane, Julia, that we were told that Mr. Lincoln told Simeon that uh, he was to tell anybody that asked that it was him that wrote it. Well, next thing we know, Mr. Lincoln's being challenged to a duel. Not only challenged, he accepted the duel and he chose broadswords as the weapon of choice. Oh, he practiced for the duel, but it had to be moved across our state line to a Missouri to avoid our state's prohibition. The place was aptly named Bloody Island, Missouri. Now, Mr. Lincoln never told me any of the particulars of that day, but I do know that Mr. A speech that <clears throat> Mr. Shields had relented and there was no blood shed, which I'm very glad. But personally, if you ask me, I think Mr. Lincoln would have shown himself splendidly and emerged with Shields' head on a silver platter. After all, the man was a Democrat. Yeah. Enough of that. Let's see what else is in here. <gasps> oh my goodness, I forgot I saved this. This is Caddy's very first pocket knife. Oh, the story that goes with this. I wasn't there, but Mr. Lincoln told it in depth to me, acted out the whole thing. It was the funniest thing I've ever witnessed in my life. I'll share it with you. The story goes that Mr. Lincoln and Caddy had gone into town. Caddy always hung on to Mr. Lincoln's coattails when they would travel into town together. And Mr. Lincoln stopped to talk to Mr. Davis. And while he's talking to Mr. Davis about that time, our son Robert came walking down the street and started talking to Taddy. And something they were talking about caught Mr. Lincoln's ear. And he decided he needed to do a little investigating. So he looks at young Taddy and he says, Taddy, show Mr. Davis that new pocket knife I bought for you. Well, Taddy looked like a deer at that moment and gave him the wide-eyed look and, and he just kind of stared at Mr. Lincoln. And Mr. Lincoln said, now, Taddy, what you, you ain't gone and lost that now, have you? And, and Taddy just stood there shaking and he looked at his father and then he looked at Bobby and then he looked at his father and he said, well, uh, no, I ain't lost it, but I ain't got it either. Mr. Lincoln looked at him, he said, well, now, Taddy, where did that knife go? And he looked over at Bobby and then he looked at his father and he says, well, uh, Bobby told me that if I were him, I would trade my pocket knife for his candy. And I did. This is when the attorney in Mr. Lincoln turns on. He looks at Bobby and he says, Robert, how much was that candy that you bought? And he says, one bit, like he thought it was a lot of money. Well, Mr. Lincoln gives him the stare down. He says, well, I'll let you know, but I paid three bits for that pocket knife. Do you think that was a fair trade? Well, Bobby was always a very honest young man. And he said, no, sir. He dug in his pocket, pulled out the knife and handed it back to Teddy. And like I said, the attorney is coming out and he looks at Tad and he says, now Tad, Robert gave you back the knife. You need to give him back the candy. <laughs> we all know that's not going to be possible. <laughs> so Taddy started stuttering and carrying on. He says, well, well, well I came because I ate it all and, and I ain't got no money to buy anymore. So Mr. Lincoln stood there, looked at Taddy, looked at Robert looked at Taddy, and this went on, he said, for a good 30, 40 seconds. And finally, he dug in his pocket and handed one bit to Taddy and said, here you go, Taddy, go buy some candy, but I don't want to hear any more deals where both are not equal. Oh, he certainly taught those boys a very good lesson that day, and he was as gentle as leading a lamb to the slaughter. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, let's see what else we've got in here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Eddie. Eddie and I and Robert came back from Lexington early December of 1849. Mr. Lincoln was on his way home from Congress after his term and was going to meet us in Springfield. I thought I could get there early and open the windows and air out the house a little bit, maybe do a little cleaning. In mid-December, our little Eddie, he took sick. We first thought, first thought it was diphtheria, but it was consumption that was pulling our Eddie into those dark shadows. He had coughing, lifeless energies, lifeless, endless coughing, and, and then it, it being tired and weak, and it just went on and on and on with the coughing and the weak. We tried everything. We tried medicines, purgatives, bloodletting. I sat with him through each night, and I would rub his tiny little chest with balsam and try to get just a spoonful of jelly between his swollen lips. And then I would beg him to please just swallow what I put into his mouth. 52 days of suffering. Our little boy, our, our angel, he died a very hard death. But two weeks, two weeks after that, funeral and that a poem was in the newspaper, one that we found very interesting and loving. I'd like to share a couple of verses, if I may. I forgot I saved this. Those midnight stars are sadly dimmed, that late so brilliantly shone, and the crimson tinge from cheek and lip with the heart's warm life has flown. The angel death was hovering nigh, and the lovely boy was called to die. But the verse that Mr. Lincoln and I liked the most, that touched us the most, was this last one. Angel boy, fare thee well, farewell, sweet Eddie. We bid thee adieu. Affection's wail cannot reach thee now, deep though it be and true. Bright is the home to him now given, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. That last line we had engraved on his tombstone. We never found out who wrote this poem or even who put it in the newspaper, but whoever did it, it was a wonderful gesture, don't you think? I certainly did. What else? I'd like to talk about something a little happier if we can. <laughs> What's this? Oh my God. A button from election. Oh my goodness. I remember that day in November of 1860 so clearly. Oh, it was nighttime and I was upstairs in the bedroom. I just put the boys to bed. And I looked down the street and I could see a crowd coming. And it was, they were cheering and throwing their hats in the air. But in the center of that crowd, taller than anyone, was Mr. Lincoln. Well, the expression I know so well on his face. He was always sad and tired, but there was always a slight smile. His face was lit by torchlight. And everyone was trying to shake his hands. Oh, my heart started beating so fast, I had to hold on to the window frame. I rushed down the stairs to greet him at the door, and I, I couldn't keep the tears from my cheeks. It was only when he came in, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said to me, Well, Molly, we are elected. That I can understand what has happened. <laughs> What a wonderful night that was. But it was actually the beginning of the end. Every time I think of those years in Washington, all I can think about is the tragedy that lie before us. 
We lost family and friends. We lost our son. But those last few weeks are the ones that are most burned into my brain. The dream that Mr. Lincoln told me about, it had to have really been bothering him or I don't think he would have ever told me. The dream in which he was awakened by the sound of weeping and he wandered through the White House trying to find its source, the East Room. And it was there a corpse lying in the casket and he, he asked the soldier standing guard, who is dead in the White House? And the answer came, the president. We had but just a few short days together after he told me that. April 9th, Lee surrendered his army and then Washington became one noisy parade. <laughs> Our Irish Tad was waving his rebel flag. The president asked the band to play Dixie. And then that carriage ride, that last carriage ride, we were both so happy on that day. Now, it was usually our custom to invite friends along with us on those afternoon carriage rides. But on that day, on that day, he deemed we should go alone, be alone. And for the first time in a very long time, we talked about the future, our future where we might live, what we might do, places we will go. And then we pulled up in front of the White House and the driver had to politely let us know we were home. You see, the president had sent me a sweet little love note earlier that week and I, I surprised him by reciting it by heart. And then the play. We were late for the play. We were always late for the plays. But that night, that night seemed to be magical. We walked into our box and, and the actors, they stopped and they turned and they bowed to our box. The orchestra started playing Hail to the Chief and the audience stood and applauded. I've never been so proud in my entire life. And I remember I spent the entire evening with my arm intertwined through his. And I remember at one point I leaned over and I said, what will Miss Harris think of me holding on to you so? And he just patted my hand and smiled and said, he'll think nothing, she'll think nothing of it. I do believe those were possibly our last words together. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to go off on a, a little crying fest. Uh, but I tend to do that a lot these days. Well, let's look in the, this trunk and see if we can't find something just a little bit more happy. Oh. <clears throat> oh. Uh, a shingle. I can't believe I saved this all this time. Oh, Mercy Levering. She was our, my best friend that lived next door to me when I was living with the Edwards. I had moved in the fall of 1839 and this was the spring of 1840. And Springfield had just been in a deluge of rain for what seemed like forever, but just weeks and weeks of rain. And one day the sun came out. And so I, I yelled at Mercy from across the lawn. I said, do you want to go into town with me? I said, we've got to go do something. And she says, Mary, how can we go into town? The roads are so muddy. And I said, well, I have a whole stack of shingles over here on the porch from when they were re shingling the roof. We can take a stack each and we can drop these in step and drop in step all the way into town. So Mercy, even though she was so prim and proper, she took me up on the challenge. So that's what we did. We took these shingles and we would drop and step, drop and step the few blocks into town. We got into town, we had some ice cream, we did some window looking, 
and the dreaming of what we were going to purchase once we could go really shopping. And then on the way home, we got to the first street and discovered all the shingles had sunk into the mud. So how were we going to get home? About that time, Mr. Hart, who drove a dray, stopped and said, would you like to jump on the cart? I'll give you a ride home. I hopped right on the back. Mercy, my ever prim and proper friend, said she would wait for a carriage. <laughs> I rode all the way back to the Edwards place. And you know what? A few weeks later, there was a poem written in the paper regarding the incident they had witnessed of me riding on the back of that dray. I don't have it in this, but I do have it in one of my trunks. I saved that paper because it was so sweet of them to take note of that moment in time. Oh, but mercy of every, what a great friend. You know, I have never been happier than when in society surrounded by precious and spiritual friends. <laughs> oh, but tonight I'm surrounded by all my merry friends, I hope. <laughs> I, I would like to say thank you to all of you for allowing me to come into your homes and, and talk to you tonight about a few of the few memories I have stored away in this trunk and I, I hope you've enjoyed a few of them. There's a lot more in here but I know you don't want to spend an entire night with me. <laughs> but I do would like to say, as, as I did say thank you, I would like to offer any time to answer some questions to you. If you would like to share any questions, I'd be more than delighted. And once again, thank you so much for allowing me to come into your home tonight. Well, thank you so much, Mrs. Lincoln. Your trunk is very interesting. And yes, we would love to hear all of the stories about all of them. There are lots of questions coming in, so we'll get to some of them. Um, one of the questions that has come in previous is, in the book, Mrs. Lincoln, the historian Catherine Clinton claims that Abraham may have been carrying a pistol the night he died. Do you believe that to be true? Oh, heavens, no. No, Mr. Lincoln would never have carried a gun. He didn't, wasn't fond of firearms. He did like to shoot them. I know he did try uh, a gun at one time and uh, it shot multiple rounds at one time. And they said he was quite a marksman. But when he was a young boy and he had to kill animals, he never really enjoyed doing that. So he just, mm, no, I don't think there was ever a pistol in his pocket. I do know he had a knife. He always carried a knife in case he needed to defend himself, but there was never, a, no, not a gun. Very good. There's enough guns for that night. Thank you very much. So true. Um, David is asking us tonight, um, Mrs. Lincoln, why do you think that Mr. Herndon seemed not to, to like you as much? Oh, probably because I didn't like him very much. Um, you know, I've given a lot of thought to that over the years. You know, when a man tells you you dance like a serpent and you're a biblical person, it's kind of a slap in the face to be, you know, aligned with a serpent that was, you know, what they assimilate to Satan. So I didn't take too lightly to it. But there was also the fact that Mr. Herndon was known to drink a little bit more than he probably should have. Mr. Lincoln and I were not partaking. We do not partake of the drink. So that's probably a lot of it. That and... I, he thinks I pick on Mr. Lincoln, but you know, he doesn't have to live with Mr. Lincoln. He'd understand maybe a little bit more. <laughs> That's fair. That's definitely fair. Um, Greg is asking, Mrs. Lincoln, will you share any conversations you had with your dressmaker, Mrs. Keckley, concerning her time with Senator Jefferson Davis and his wife prior to the Civil War? You know, that's very interesting because when I was interviewing Mrs. Keckley, we were talking about some of the ladies that she had been sewing for, and she said she had sewn for Mrs. Senator Davis. And as soon as she said that, my ears perked up, and I thought, well, if she's good enough to, to sew for her, she's good enough to sew for me. And I snatched her right away from her. I mean, they wanted to take her to Richmond, Virginia. This was a free woman. She wasn't going to go into a slave state and, and risk being, you know, put into that position of being captured and made into a slave again. She wasn't a fool. 
She's a smart woman. Absolutely. One question that's come in is, why did Mr. Lincoln call you Molly? Molly, you know, I, sometimes I like to think that maybe when he first met me, he forgot my name, you know, that I was a Mary, not a Molly. I don't know. But it was always a sweet gesture when he would call me Molly. And he would say it occasionally in front of friends. And eventually some of my friends were even calling me Molly. I thought it was kind of a cute name personally, but I really don't know why he ever started it, except for the fact that it was just a nickname like you give to anybody you care for. Absolutely. We all have those. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, James is asking, to what degree did you provide advice to Mr. Lincoln during the Lincoln-Douglas debates? Oh, during the debates? Oh, none. Not very much at all. No, he didn't need my help for, for those debates. He, you know, he was well first. Now, when we were in the White House on occasion, he would tell me about things that were going on. And of course, I would give him my opinion. Not that he ever took it. I don't think he ever took my opinion. But on occasion, he would because he, he was very respectful of my political savvy. Uh, I, I was raised around the political world. So I did have good instincts about people. Um, obviously, I didn't have good instincts about Henry Clay because I thought he was going to be president and got in a fight with some girl over Henry Clay one time when we were younger. But uh, yeah, I was, I was a Henry Clay girl all the way. And that was one of the things that Mr. Lincoln found very fascinating that I knew a man that he admired. <laughs> Shirley is asking us tonight, Mrs. Lincoln, did Joshua really take Lincoln's knife with the breakup of Mary? Well, that's what he told me. That's all I know is that he just, you know, I think he kind of had heard about, um, and I don't want to go there, with the Ann Rutledge situation, but that was a very good friend of his, and he did get, get quite emotional, and, and they were worried about him doing it then, so I think maybe Joshua might have just thought, hmm, if he's going to get upset about one, he could get upset again about it, get another one. Lincoln had a very melancholy to him, and I think sometimes when people are very melancholy, it, it, it does, it is a scary time for people. So, you know, I'm glad somebody was looking out for him. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Dick Moran is asking, which of your four children were your favorite? Well, to be honest, um, Willie was our favorite. I mean, it's, I mean, and I know that sounds harsh, but he was in, in, in many ways. One, he was born 10 months after we lost our Eddie. Um, that's why I've heard people say he's the replacement child, which I guess into some factor he was. But he was the one that was probably the most like both Mr. Lincoln and myself. He loved literature. He loved to write. He was a beautiful writer. Oh my goodness, some of the poems he wrote when he wrote one uh, about, um, oh gosh, I've just drawn a blank, but he just, he's, he's written a lot of wonderful things. And he was just a very brilliant young man. And it's just sad that he was taken from us so soon because I think he would have been, I think he would have been a politician. Much like his father. Very good. Very good. Um, Matthew is asking, did you have a favorite neighbor in Springfield? <sighs> well, Mrs. Sprigg and I spent a lot of time together. Uh, her daughter to help take care of the children on occasion. We had, you know, we had moments. I, you know, mostly I hung out with my sisters. You know, I was visiting Frances a lot because she just lived right down the street and around the corner. So she was the closest of my sisters because Anne and uh, Elizabeth all both lived in Aristocracy Hill. We lived on the other side of town. So Francis and I spent a great deal of time together. But not, you know, Mrs. Sprick was probably the one person I spent the most time with in the neighborhood. Now, Mrs. Dean across the street, um, we were acquaintances, but Mr. Lincoln, when her husband left and was gonna go find gold, and all that stuff and then he never came back and after years of waiting he finally you know said why don't we just get you a divorce and that way you know you can just move on with your life and she agreed to that but she never called herself a divorcee or whatever the word is that they use 
but she would rather be referred to as a widow. So, widow Dean. Matthew also has another question. Did you ever seriously consider an alternate to Mr. Lincoln, like perhaps Stephen du Douglas? Oh, heavens no. <laughs> One, Stephen was short. And two, he was a Democrat. I could never have, polit I would have gone politically crazy being married to somebody that was so conservative as he was, and he was pro-slavery. And I'm, mm -mm. no, 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 I set my sights on Mr. Lincoln when I first moved to Springfield. When I heard him talking one time, he was talking to, I think it was a barber or some, it was a man not of means. And he was talking to him the same way I heard him talk to many aristocrats. You know, I mean, he treated everybody with the same respect. And I admired that about him, that he didn't see class, he didn't see color. He, you know, his barber, you know, was, he wanted to take him to the White House. And they said, we got barbers. But, you know, he, he, he was an African-American man that cut Mr. Lincoln's hair because his hair was so wiry. He thought, who better to cut his hair than someone had hair like his? <laughs> so That's he liked awesome. his hair cut. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, David is asking, Mr. Lincoln loved your legendary white cake. Um, do you have a recipe that you'd be willing to share, or perhaps it's a family secret? Well, not to step out of character, but it's out there for you to find if you want to find it. It's not real hard to find. It's pretty, it's pretty common out there, but it's just a basic white cake. But I would suggest if you do try it, you might want to throw in about a cup of sour cream just to give it a little moisture because that almond flour is really dry and it really drinks the liquid. But it's not a family secret. It was just one we got from a, a bakery when, uh, in Lexington. My sisters and I, we went and, and asked them for the recipe and they were, since we were leaving, they were gracious enough to allow us to have it. So we brought it home with us. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. We'll have to look it up. Well, maybe we can post it out there later for everyone. Yeah. Um, John is asking, did you miss your life back in Springfield when you were in the White House? On occasions, yes, I did. Um, I was alone a lot. You know, um, people don't realize that when you're in the White House, especially in the time of, of the dire situation that Mr. Lincoln was put in, uh, there wasn't a lot of time for us to spend together in family time. Um, and so there were days, but um, I left the White House on many occasions just because it was one, it was a dangerous place to be. And second of all, I was just lonely. I didn't have anybody to talk to very often. So going to New York and shopping was a cure-all for, I think it's a cure-all for any woman <laughs> depressed. So. I, I spent a lot of time shopping in New York, and, and uh, you know, we'd go with the, with the boys. On occasion, Robert would join us when he'd leave, he'd leave Harvard and join us on occasion because he was right there close, so he'd come into the city and, and, uh, and be with me and Teddy. So it was, it was okay. Very good. But I was lonely at times. Absolutely, as anyone would be in that situation. Um, Cheryl is asking, you were quite the fashionista. Where did you get the inspiration for some of your dresses? Uh, from Europe, actually. Uh, when I, had, I went to Europe early in, um, late, well, early in my teens, I had gone to Europe, and then I went once when uh, Mr. Lincoln and I were in the White House. I went over for a few months, and, um, but uh, I found the fashions in, in, in Europe to be much more uh, risque. I don't want to say that I enjoyed, but I just, I had a good bosom and I, I felt like, you know, their dresses helped me display what God gave me. And uh, miss, much to Mr. Lincoln's dismay on, on one occasion, he told me that uh, the tail of my dress would be better suited around the shoulders. <laughs> so, but uh, no, I just, I, I, the European styles were what I enjoyed and I tried to bring them into to the United States. Um, they seem to be a little bit further down off the shoulder than most of the ones that were being created in America. Um, 
here's a question coming in from Tanya. Why did you dislike Robert's wife so much? You know, I did not dislike Robert's wife. I'm the person who got them together in the first place. So if I didn't like her, I sure as heck wouldn't have put them together. No, a lot of that got blown out of proportion during my, my time when I was having a little bit of a breakdown, I guess they were calling it. You know, I lost my son, Chad. And uh, then um, I was trying desperately to find any way to resolve the misery that I was experiencing. And I will have to say that I think I was experiencing something, but I don't know what it was, but you know, I just um, started imagining things, so to speak, uh, about what was being done. Um, but I think what set us off was um, she, Mary Harlan, had gone to um, take care of her parents in Iowa. I think it was her, either her, I think it was her father was ill. And she went back to Iowa to spend time with them to help take care of them. And I moved in with Robert. For several months, it was just me and Robert and, and, um, and Mamie. And then when Mary came back, I didn't want to leave. And you just can't have two wives in the same house. It doesn't work, you know. And I was the, I looked at myself as the, the matron and I was older and I felt like my word had to uh, be more listened to than her word, even though it was her house. <laughs> so, so I don't think I disliked her. I think a lot of it came in, and I'm gonna step out of character here. Let's take up the glass. When Mary was having her, her mental issues, which yes, she was, she was having some seriously mental issues. A lot of things she manufactured in her head. I mean, it was just, it, you know, um, when you talk to pharmacists about the use of laudanum and the use of carbohydrate, which I know there's some discussion on, did she take laudanum? Did she not? Well, laudanum was bought, you could buy that across the counter. So I'm, I'm going, I think anybody that had a headache would be fine with buying it because it would have been common use for pain relief. The chlorhydrate was new to her, to the whole country. They didn't even know how to dispense it. They gave it to her and said, take this prudently. Mary doesn't know the understand the word prudent. So there's just a lot of things that she was dealing with when you're taking an upper and a downer at the same time or to fighting different things. It's just, it's going to create a lot of mental issues. They found that out in the 60s when they first created birth control pills and uh, found out that it was like speed, you know, because it was just... You know, diet pills, you'd be taking diet pills, but then you'd have to take a sleeping pill at night. I mean, it was just, there's, you know, you experiment with things and you find you can't take certain things together. Well, they didn't know that back then. Yeah. And, you know, she was doing it. But, you know, I know there's a lot of controversy and in, in decisions, did she or didn't she? But personally, my opinion, she did. I think she did take them. And I do think she took them at the same time because they were for two different types of things. One was her pain, one was to help her sleep. I think she was having adverse reactions, but long story short, she didn't not like Mary Harlan. She yeah. just, it was just, there was just too much conflict between here. Yeah. Well, that, that makes total sense. Um, yes. One of the questions come in from Paul is, did you, um, did Mrs. Lincoln and Robert ever have any ill will or hostility towards each other since he had you committed and did you ever reconcile before Mrs. Lincoln passed? Yes. Okay. After after the institutionalization, uh, one, she refused to see Robert when she was in in Bellevue Place. Um, then she, after she's found of reason, which I go, it's like okay, she goes from insane to of reason in a year. Uh, <clears throat> but she was better because she wasn't taking all those drugs. They took her off all those when she was at Bellevue Place. So that goes to figure that that would help a lot with the confusion and things she was feeling. But her personality is not going to change. She was born a strong-willed person, and she's going to always be that person. So, yeah. So um, what was the question? I nope, don't know. That was really it. Did you guys ever reconcile? We did. We did reconcile. They, they have found, um, I think, one or two letters I, in talking to Jason Emerson that shows that there was communication 
um, as of, I want to say the October before she died that December, uh, I mean that next July. So in fact, today is the day she goes into her uh, coma and tomorrow she will breathe her last breath. So tomorrow's her death day. Oh, wow. Um. Uh, Janet is asking, would you describe Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln's wedding? It was a simple wedding because it was done uh, quickly. Um, they, um, it was, you know, they, they'd been engaged supposedly once and they didn't want the interference of her sisters, which I totally believe that her sisters were very primary in the breaking up of their first relationship. I think Lincoln started doubting himself being able to support a woman that is a Todd with two Ds, not just one, like God, you know, to quote Mr. Lincoln. But, you know, I mean, um, so this, it was, it was, let's do this. They went to, Rev, you know, Lincoln goes to Reverend Dresser and says, I want to marry Mary. We want to come to your house and be married in this house. And, and they had it all planned. And then he made the mistake of telling Ninian, who went and told Elizabeth. And Elizabeth blew up and said, no, 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 no. So it was postponed until the next day. And they were married in the Edwards home at, on that day. So, in fact, they even said that the cake was still warm when they were eating it. And that's how rushed it was. So, but it was a simple dress. She used uh, Frances's dress when she was married. She wore Frances's gown. And it was done in the parlor of the Edwards place. But I've always thought it was just too darn bad they didn't get to be married in the dresser house because they could have been married in the house they eventually purchased. That is true. That is yeah, true. would have been a great story. Full circle, that would have been good. Yeah. Uh, David has asked some time ago um, if you were going to break the character. He, he's noticed that you, you played Mrs. Lincoln very well as older and widowed Mary. Um, did you ever play Mary in her younger years? No, because my younger years were not here. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I started, I'm an actress. I started playing Mary when in the play that you did at the museum, The Last of Mrs. Lincoln. And, um, you know, it was, it, was, it, it was like a gift that landed in my lap. When I moved to Springfield, I was lost. I, you know, theater companies and, and communities are hard to break into. I mean, because they're already set in stone and they don't like newbies. You know, so it's really hard. And, and Phil Funkenbush gave me probably the best thing I could have ever been handed was that role. Because within a couple of weeks after doing that play, I get an email from Beardstown Historical Society asking me to come and talk about Mary. It's like, I don't know a damn thing about Mary. I knew enough to get me through a play. So I started reading the biography front to back and I just fell in love, you know, because she's a very misunderstood woman and um, she's brilliant she has education beyond her her what she would have should have had as a woman I mean for a woman I mean I know more I don't know many men in history that have as much education as Mary Lincoln did she had 12 years of formal education and that's unheard of you know they might get to fourth fifth grade and then that was enough you got through you, then you went and learned how to you know do something silly you know, but women never talked politics, you know, their voices were never heard, you know, but Mary would host these little, little tete-a-tetes in her house when, when Mercy would come in, and she married James Conkling, and he was a big senator. I mean, all these ladies that loved politics, but they couldn't open their mouths. So Mary would host these things, and they would sit there, and they would figure it all out. Too bad they didn't let them run the country. One of the questions that did come in earlier tonight was just saying, like, how did you do your research and your your sources to learn more about Mary and her life? My way of, re when I read a book, I read a biography and I look for stories and then I look in the next biography and I see if I can find the same story. If I don't find that story in any other book, I usually don't talk about it because sometimes those can be contrived from something. It's kind of like um, the Helm book. It's a good book. I love it. Uh, it's written by Catherine Helm, which is um, uh, her, her younger sister, Emily's daughter, Catherine, who did come to the White House during the Civil War as a little bitty girl. And so some of it is like, I don't know if those are true stories. We don't know because that's the only way. It's kind of like hearsay. 
But I love the story about Mary riding her pony over to Henry Clay's house and knocking on the door and asking to please come out and judge her horse because he was supposed to be so good about horses and then ends up in the house sitting at the table with some dignitary he was entertaining and talking politics as a little girl. And it's just, it's just, it's, it's such, it's so, it's a lovely story, but it's, it's one we kind of tiptoe around as presenters because we don't know um, how, where that story comes from because we don't know that Mary would have ever talked about it because she would have gotten in trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's what kind of makes all this fun though, how the stories evolve over time and stuff. Yeah, so. but I, I always try to make sure I find them in at least two sources before I will address them as, as, as a possible truth. Very good. There's a lot about Mary that we just don't know because so much of her letters and things were lost yes. because of Robert. You know, you know, it's like shame on them. And when they left Springfield, they didn't want to take any, they didn't want to have anything that somebody could find and read that family secrets might get up. So they burned everything before they left Springfield. So it's like shame on them. You know, we, we would know so much more if they hadn't been so private, but they were private. And that's why doing this is so hard because Mary would never have sat down and talked to you about her life. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, another question is coming from Thomas. Did uh, Mrs. Lincoln ever visit Mr. Lincoln's tomb? And if so, what did she think of that? Okay, um, that's a hard question. Um, I do know in the Keckley book, there is a piece of correspondence that Keckley, I don't think she included it. I think the, the, the editor did, but whatever the case, included a note that Mary had written to Mrs. Keckley asking her to go with her to Springfield as she wanted to see Mr. Lincoln's tomb. But I don't know, the, the tomb I don't think was even finished when this was going, because it didn't, wasn't finished until I think 76 or something like that, I can't remember. But, and it would have been, because they kind of broke their relationship up after the old clothes scandal fell apart. <clears throat> so, um, but there is a note in there that she was going to go and that she went and she left in the dead of night that she and Taddy went, they looked and then they left on the train and went back to Chicago. But that's all I know. Yeah. Well, that's good. I know she went once with jo uh, with John Stewart to uh, look at the place that they were going to build the tomb. And she got violently ill before they could even get out there. She just, she just, the thought of it, well, because he kept saying, now we're, this is what we're going to do. And there's going to be plenty of room for you and the boys. And it's like, it was just too overwhelming for her to think about, you know, that kind of thing. She was just, she, I don't like to sound mean, but I think Mary, the best thing Mary knew how to do was to mourn. She was very good at it. She was a very, she was a very good at mourning. Well, she certainly faced a lot of tragedy yeah. all of them did in their life. So none of us could quite relate to that for sure. But so I don't want to relate to that. No, absolutely not. So we'll wrap it up for tonight. We just want to thank you so much, Pam, for allowing us to experience Mrs. Lincoln while we're all safe at home. You are stellar as always. Um, and so Pam has mentioned, if we didn't get to your question tonight, I will share her email with you all in a follow-up email that'll go out tomorrow. So you can contact Pam and ask other Mrs. Lincoln questions. We appreciate all of you so much for tuning in tonight. Again, we thank you so much for supporting um, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. We wouldn't be able to do this without our donors, without our supporters and our members like you. So please consider making a donation at ALPLM.org or purchasing a gift membership for other people to be able to enjoy this virtual programming like you are as a member. And as you log off tonight, there is a very short survey. If you, it'll pop up, it'll take less than 60 seconds. Just lets us know how we can continue to improve this and what we can do for you in the future. Again, thank you, Pam, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.